Good afternoon, Professor Lohan, Mike Lohan. That's right. Yes, it's a great pleasure to interview you. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, I guess you can be considered as one of the father of the Glossina sequence project. Will you agree on that one? Yes, and together with <coughs> Sarap Aksoy in Yale, I think we came up with the original idea. Uh, we went to TDR, which is part of WHO, and persuaded them that it was a good idea. And that they provided the money for the original meetings, which we uh, arranged with the various sequencing groups around the world to try and get it off the ground. And how did you manage to convince them? Well, the argument with TDR, with WHO, was that Tetsu World was really dying. There are very few Tetsu labs now left in the world. We wanted to try and inject some new enthusiasm back into the Tetsu world to attract new young people in to start new laboratories. And TDR agreed that that was something that was essential. Um, when we got the funders into the room, when we got the Sanger Centre and Raiken and the other people who came, we tried to put that argument forward, but we also pointed out that um, in the uh, sequencing we'd done to date before that, the small scale sequencing, the EST programs, that the um, Tetsi fly was lining up very, very closely with Drosophila and was going to make a wonderful comparative model for Drosophila. And in fact, a lot of people um, in the Drosophila world agreed with this and um, argued with Sanger that it, that was a good, very good reason for doing a Glossina project. And I'm very pleased to say that we've now got agreement from the Sanger to do a 6x coverage of, uh, of the Glossina morstans morstans um, genome. And what is the current status of the work? Well, the Sanger have agreed to do the whole 6x coverage, and they've started with that work already. Um, we're hoping that Raiken will have a, f from Japan will have um, some money freed this summer to actually become part of the project as well. And if that's the case, we can do 9x coverage. Well, with the 6x coverage, we're confident that will be finished. The sequencing will be finished by the end of 2007. But then, of course, we have a we've got to annotate that genome, and that is the most difficult part of it. Um, we've lined up a lot of people, a lot of them from the Drosophila world, to help us with this. And we feel that that probably will be completed by the middle of 2008, or early to middle 2008. That's the hope. And what exactly do you expect that will come out, out of the Glossina genome that we do not know already from the Drosophila genome? Oh, well, they're very different insects. I mean, um, Tessie flies have an incredibly unusual life cycle. They uh, only feed on blood. There's no other nutrient resource goes into the animal at all, at any stage. They give birth to live young, which is extremely unusual in insects. So I'm sure that there's going to be some very unusual um, modifications to the uh, biochemical pathways inside these insects. I think there's some, some very interesting biology to be learned there. Yeah, well, we could argue, okay, that uh, they're a blood-sucking insect, mm. but uh, uh, the anophel is also a blood-sucking insect, yeah. and I believe there is also an ongoing project aiming to sequence uh, the anophel's genome. Is that correct? The anopheles genome is finished and published. Okay. There's an Aedes uh, genome coming down the line as well. But these are quite quite distant from Drosophila, the Anopheles mm. and Aedes. I mean, in evolutionary terms, um, you're talking about the time when perhaps um, human beings appeared from the, from the sea, you know, from when our ancestors appeared from the sea. That was when Drosophila and Anopheles diverged. So it's not surprising mm. there's quite a lot of uh, differences between them in, in genomic content. Tetsi and Drosophila are much closer together. So I suppose a stronger argument there, if you were making that argument, would be mm -hmm. why do it because we've already got Drosophila. But I think there is an excellent argument. I mean, it's, uh, there will be distinct differences, I'm quite convinced, by the different lifestyles. And what do you think will be the major output of the knowledge of the sequence of the Glossina? OK, I mean, I'm there's two answers to that question. And one is, one is an obvious one and one is a non-so obvious. I'll start with the non-obvious one first. We need. Control of, of uh, trypanosomiasis on the African continent, the human disease and the animal disease, depends heavily on killing tsetse flies. All of the large-scale programs that have been successful in Zimbabwe, in Botswana, and the control of the human disease depends very heavily on killing tsetse. We need entomologists there to back that up. It's essential. And, but believe it or not, these are disappearing. These entomology, these tsetse fly laboratories are disappearing. So one of the most important things is to drag new young people into this field. Now, that's one answer. 
On the straight biology side of it, I think there are a lot of things that we could uh, learn from a genome project. And I'll give you some examples. Um, we have very, very good traps for the savannah group tsetse flies. These are the ones that transmit the nagana to, to animals. And these are very good traps because they have excellent odour baits which will attract the flies in. But we've not been as successful at all with developing traps for palpalis group flies. These are the flies that mainly transmit human disease. So one of the things we're very interested in is developing new odour baits for these traps for human, for the species which transmit human mm. disease. And we feel one route that we can take to do that is the molecular route by looking at the odorant binding proteins from more stands, comparing them with odorant binding proteins from, um, from the Papalis group flies. Other things that we can look at, which we're looking at currently, are natural killing molecules within the tessie fly, which kill trypanosomes. For example, if you, if you feed uh, trypanosomes to 100 tetsi flies, on average, you'll get about only 15 infected flies. 85 of those flies will kill off all those trypanosomes and eliminate them. So there are some interesting molecules within this animal which are uh, capable of killing these flies. Um, and we've actually got a handle, we think, on one of these molecules at the moment, mm -hmm. which is something we call tetsi EP, which we believe is possibly a lectin within the fly, and we're currently working on it. And that work was enabled by having a genome available. And there are lots of, there are other studies, Serapaxoi in Yale, for example, is very interested in trying to produce paratransgenic tsetse flies. These are not transgenic flies because that's impossible to produce. This is transforming the bacteria which are always present in the gut of the fly. And to get these bacteria to uh, produce molecules which will in, in turn mm kill trypanosomes. And she's had quite some success in doing that. And the genome project is just going to make this, her life, so much easier in trying to achieve those ends. Okay, so if I follow you, following you well, mm. your, your, your target is basically to kill the tsetse fly and to find new way of killing the, the tsetse fly. Is, is really your, your dream to have a world without tsetse flight, will you agree with that? Well, that's, uh, I can see where your argument is going. I, I think a world without tsetse flies might have quite an impact on African wildlife, and um, I can't predict that what, what that will be. I can just look at the simple problem that there are many hundreds, probably hundreds of thousands of human beings suffering from the disease. Um, there is a, probably a five billion dollar a year loss to African agriculture because of the disease. And, try to take, put forward simple uh, solutions, not simple solutions, but solutions that will perhaps try and deal with those problems. Now, what impact that's going to have on a more global scale on Africa um, is, you know, not for me to say. I'm, a, I'm an entomologist. But you are personally convinced that the, the savannah without the tsetse flight will be a better savannah? I think it will be a different savannah, but I'd like um, ecologists and uh, population geneticists and particularly politicians to think very hard. If we can produce a tsetse fly free savanna, it needs to be carefully considered what, uh, what we're going to do with it and how that will develop. Okay, thank you very much.